This is the Odyssey Mobius Review. I want to start this off on the right foot, and I do not want any misunderstandings. The Mobius is an amazing headphone. I had read and heard so many opinions about it, but when I tried them myself, I was blown away. There are very few headphones that do what the Mobius can, effortlessly. As you may know, I am critical of several Odyssey products. The LCD-1 is an overhyped headphone that Odyssey lied about. The LCD-2GX is a laughable cash grab for the gaming community. And Odyssey has discontinued some promising products like the Decker DAC Amp and Sign and EL-8 headphones. But the Mobius has opened my eyes. I am now convinced, beyond any doubt, that Odyssey made an amazing product in the Mobius. That is, the Mobius is amazingly awful in every single respect. It doesn't even do the things it is specifically designed to do. It fails in presenting audio accurately. It is among the most uncomfortable headphones I have ever worn. Its 3D technology is a licensing deal with the actual creators of the so-called technology, and the implementation is done so poorly that I'm shocked Odyssey marketed the Mobius. The Mobius effortlessly falls short as an audiophile headphone. It effortlessly insults audio enthusiasts and gamers alike. It is in one fell swoop able to alienate both camps it is trying to appease. Congratulations, Odyssey. You did it again. Just when I thought you couldn't get any dumber, you went and made the Mobius. I am truly blown away by how royally you screwed this up. As you know, I buy products with my own money and conduct thorough reviews of them. When I buy audio gear, I do it with the goal that I want to enjoy the gear. It's not just another piece of equipment to me. I assume most audiophiles think like this. To us, a headphone must pair well with our setup and listening preferences. It requires time, effort, experience, and a basic understanding of components to have even a chance to navigate around the nonsense manufacturers throw at us. Some headphones have features that, though detrimental to the original sound quality, are very useful. For example, the Sony wireless headphone, the WH-M1000X Mark III, has possibly the best active noise cancellation function of any headphone. The loss of original audio fidelity is worth it for those moments you need to drone out a whiny child. But there are other headphones that make no sense at all. This is where the Odyssey Mobius comes into play. I have mentioned the Mobius on a number of occasions. That is because a friend of mine allowed me to listen to it for a while. As he sat in front of me, his eyes wide open, I knew he loved his Mobius. He spoke so highly of it. He was surprised with the 3D effect. He was joyful of the sound quality. He said the Mobius had now become his mobile headphone of choice, which was saying quite a lot since my friend owns many headphones of excellent caliber. During that initial impression, done months ago, he asked me what I thought. It was apparent he wanted me to agree to say something positive. He knows of my very critical nature that I can be brutally honest sometimes. And I was brutally honest with him too. I told him why I very much immediately disliked the Mobius. I saw his chest fall slightly. I gave the headphones back to him and we did not speak of them for almost a year. Many months later, my friend asked about the Sony WH-M1000X Mark III, and after a brief discussion, he bought one. He loves it. His Mobius is now sitting at home, gathering dust. He has tried selling the Mobius, but he has been unsuccessful thus far. People need to try equipment before they comment on it. My one-time listening session with the Mobius was enough to leave a bad taste in my mouth, but I recognize 30 minutes is not enough time for a review. I needed to do that review. People need to know this thing is Odyssey's laziness at peak volume. So I asked my friend if I could borrow the Mobius for a few weeks to listen. He agreed. I had to recharge the batteries because they had died since my friend had last used these headphones. This is the Mobius review in just one video. I chose not to conduct my typical thorough analytical approach video by video. There will not be three videos of the bass, mids, and treble response. There will not be videos of comparison headphones. This is it, in one shot. Because this is all the Mobius deserves, one shot. One shot to the headphone to put it out of its misery. Here are all the reasons why the Odyssey Mobius is a subpar product 
packaged in Odyssey's name. This is going to be long, which is fitting considering how many things the Mobius does wrong. Not to be crass, but in the slang word rubber means condom. There is a specific sensation of that uh, product. Let's not dwell on it. Let us just merely agree that we understand what rubber feels like. The Mobius wears a condom. Look, when you touch any other Odyssey headphone, they feel like high quality products. Wood, magnesium, leather, metal, or in the case of the LCD One, plastic that feels right at home with a $100 headphone. I have never before felt an Odyssey headphone like the Mobius. There is a rubber coating of some sort. It is slick. There's no grip to it. The coating is on the ear cups and the headband. And it's thick. I mean, it's really thick. This type of coating is on products like the Sony noise cancelling headphones, though done a lot better. And some older Beats headphones, again, much better. Some might argue that the outer coating is to protect the headphones from damage. I would love to see some research and development data about that. Oh wait, there is research and development into this sort of thing. It's called IPX ratings. The Mobius doesn't have an IPX rating. That's because the Mobius's rubber coating does not actually protect the headphone, or Odyssey didn't care to have their headphones tested for IPX certification. Then there is the constant creaking and squeaking. These headphones are built like your typical cheap headphone. The fit and finish at $400 is shockingly missing. Let me explain. The rubber coating, as we have just discussed, is unnecessary and very weird to touch. When comparing the left and right ear cups, I could feel that the coatings are different. The left ear cup seems to have some roughness while the right ear cup feels smoother. I do not know if this was purposeful or simply a manufacturing defect. It is, however, inconsistent. The ear pads are much too small for me. They are three knuckles wide, but seem smaller when you put them on. The top of my ears are bent inside the ear cups. There is insufficient padding as well. These are not the typical Odyssey pads. The ear pads are not made of leather or memory foam. Instead, they are fake leather and a sponge. And not very deep sponge at that. The clamping force is surprisingly tight. It is tighter than any other Odyssey headphone I have worn. It is tighter than the clamping force on the Beats Pro. It is just a little bit tighter than the Beats by Dre Pro Studio headphones, which are notoriously clampy. Somehow, Odyssey made a headphone whose clamping force is worse than their Sign or One More Triple Driver or even the Bear Dynamic DT1770. Hey, look, the 1770 actually wins in one respect. The headband feels stiff, hard as a 4x4 plank. There is insufficient padding there. It appears Odyssey decided to use a 3 inch long rolled up sponge as the headband pad. It is uncomfortable and fatiguing. There is no cushion on the top of my head, rather a constant reminder that this headphone is pressing down on me. The headphones weigh over 12 ounces or 350 grams. I have worn headphones that weigh more and less, so this is about average. But combine the average weight with the tight clamp, the cheap ear cups, the non-existent headband padding, and you have a perfect mixture of discomfort. When you are a competitive gamer or a casual listener, you want a comfortable pair of headphones that will not cause discomfort over several hours. The Mobius causes discomfort within moments. The last thing you need is a vice on your head. Unfortunately, the Mobius's clamping force and small, cheap ear pads are fatiguing. There are a few positives about the build, however. I think that the placement of the controls on the left ear cup was thoughtful. The power button is on the outside of the ear cup, so you won't accidentally turn off the headphones as you adjust volume or trigger the 3D button. The buttons are well spaced so you can easily feel them as you're playing a game. Again, this is not a touch sensitive headphone. I am also happy that Odyssey implemented USB-C and not micro or mini USB as some companies are still doing. It is nice to see that Odyssey provides multiple connection options, Bluetooth, USB, and 3.5mm, something for everybody. And that's it. Odyssey did the absolute bare minimum. I know Odyssey. I know what they're capable of. I have many of their headphones, and not all provide superb sound quality. That of course is a subjective preference. What one person thinks is quality, another might say is trash. But personal preference is different from objective facts. Despite what some audiophiles say, sound and audio gear do have objective, specific, articulable facts to discuss. 
Those who say that something sounds fuzzy or warm or like an x-ray without more concrete information like the ability to speak like an adult. Such mysterious language hides the reviewer's ignorance. I have repeatedly shown that you can tell the difference between products while using concrete language. It is rather easy if you use common sense. For example, we can talk about soundstage by describing how bookshelf speakers sound in different sized rooms. We can talk about bass by describing the bass we hear in the theater or in our living rooms or from across the street in the car into which the moron teenager put a $2,000 subwoofer in his $800.1989 Honda Civic. We can discuss mids and vocals by speaking of where those vocals are placed on a stage, how those vocals stand out from the mix, whether there is any treble spike in their voices. We can talk about the treble in the same manner. We can discuss detail retrieval by actually counting footsteps or the creaking of wood in songs. We can point out how loud those sounds are. All of this combined gives us a fair approximation of the sound character. <laughs> there is no mystery. This is how I compare headphones and how I have analyzed the Odyssey LCD-1, the LCD-2 Pre-Phasor, the LCD-2 Phasor, the LCD-2 Classic, the LCD-2 Close Back, the LCD-3, the LCD-4Z, the Sign, and the EL-8. And this is the process I used with the Mobius. I listened to the Mobius using the USB, Bluetooth, and 3.5mm connections. I listened to the Mobius for many hours. I used Spotify Premium and high resolution FLAC files. I listened through USB-C, 3.5mm, and Bluetooth. I listened for just the sound signature while sitting still and also in combination with the vaunted 3D effect. I listened at home, at work, and even at coffee shops, much to my own chagrin. And I find that the Mobius is one of the most below average, overinflated headphones I have ever heard. I'm being generous when I say the Mobius sound average at best, and absolutely not worth their $400 price tag. These headphones are a slap in the face to anyone who believes they will get the traditional Odyssey sound signature. The overall sound signature in the Mobius is muffled and closed. The soundstage is below average, like you're hearing small bookshelf speakers in your bedroom. There is insufficient separation of the bass and mids, meaning vocals do not stand out in a mix when the bass is playing, making it harder to hear the tonality of every vocalist in a song. Let us talk about particulars and dig into the performance. When you're considering these headphones, you should know how the volume will respond. You might expect the volume level to not change based merely on the connection type, but it does indeed change. The Bluetooth connection sounds muted at almost all times. At 50% volume, the Mobius' drivers are clearly not being driven at peak performance. Around 80% volume, the headphones finally start providing sufficient power to the drivers. In comparison, the 3.5mm connection provides slightly more volume at 50% than Bluetooth at 50%. But there was a strange result when I compared volumes at 80% on 3.5mm and 80% on Bluetooth. At 80% volume on 3.5mm, the Mobius sounded a bit muddier than 80% volume over Bluetooth. I repeated this test several times with the same result. Keep in mind, I did not use any amplifier with the 3.5mm connection. The reason is very simple. Because Odyssey does not claim you need an amplifier. These headphones are for gamers first and audiophiles second. I mean, technically. Consequently, I wanted to test the 3.5mm connection as it would sound directly off the motherboard, not enhanced in any way through an amplifier. Moreover, Odyssey says that the Movius doesn't really need an amplifier. The USB connection sounds the loudest. At 50% volume, the USB connection is demonstrably louder than either Bluetooth or 3.5mm. At 80%, the USB connection can provide nearly overwhelming volume. There are indeed tonal differences as well. The Bluetooth connection sounds the muddiest of all. I doubt that is a surprise. Odyssey markets the Mobius with three Bluetooth codecs, SBC, AAC, and LDAC. SBC is the standard that almost any device will use. It is the lowest quality. AAC is Apple's codec, which is used in its devices but not widely accepted elsewhere. LDAC is a Sony technology that promises better fidelity than SBC. LDAC is available in most modern Android devices, but it is not available on iOS, macOS, or Windows. Sony claims that LDAC can maintain 24-bit at 96kHz, but actual tests of LDAC demonstrate that the maximum transmission rate is rarely stable. Indeed, often LDAC down-converts the audio signal to maintain signal strength and connection. 
but it doesn't really matter since LDAC is limited to Android. You won't find this information on the Mobius webpage, or in the manual, or on the quick reference manual. No. You will find the truth by first researching what LDAC is and then stumbling onto a webpage Odyssey created to address this question. This page shows that LDAC is supported only with Android and frankly only certain Android devices. Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android all use SBC or AAC. But LDAC, the highest quality Bluetooth codec, arguably, is not available on Windows or Mac. You know, the platforms that gamers use to play games. This should be of some concern. There is so much misinformation about Bluetooth that without research a person can and is misled. Odyssey does very little in clarifying the Mobius' Bluetooth capability, at least up front. Here's the bottom line. Unless you have an Android device capable of LDAC, the Mobius will always provide either SBC, the lowest resolution Bluetooth codec, or AAC, arguably better than SBC. But Odyssey did not include Aptex or Aptex HD support. Odyssey claims that the Mobius provides exceptional sound quality in any connection. This is clearly not true. Besides the volume discrepancies using different connection options, the Bluetooth connection codec contributes to the confusion. If you purchase the Mobius thinking you have found a planar magnetic headphone that will provide great sound quality over Bluetooth, think again. Your Windows computer will transmit SBC, the lowest quality Bluetooth codec. Your computer is likely capable of transmitting Aptex or Aptex HD, but the Mobius isn't capable of receiving those higher bandwidth signals. And there's another major problem. The Mobius was released in 2019. Odyssey and its fanboys claim that Odyssey is among the finest audio companies, continually pushing the envelope. I could not disagree more. Odyssey brought planar magnetics to the forefront and have made some exceptional gear, but the company has become complacent, lazy, and insults the consumer's intelligence. Here's a bit of a doozy. Are you ready? What Bluetooth version do you think the Mobius uses? Remember, there have been 10 Bluetooth versions since 1999. The Mobius was released in 2019, as I said. The most recent Bluetooth version is 5.1. Go ahead, look on the Mobius sales page. Odyssey does not say. This, I found, is very strange. It turns out that the Mobius, a $400 Bluetooth headphone from 2019, uses Bluetooth version 4.1. Version 4.1 was released in 2013. Version 5.0 was released in 2016, three years before the Mobius came out. Putting in Bluetooth 4.1 in a product being sold in 2020 is not a joke. It is a sad, disappointing, and very telling fact about Odyssey. The Odyssey webpage addressing Bluetooth codecs does make one admission, a confession that should have been part of the marketing and not an afterthought. Near the bottom of the Bluetooth codec homepage, Odyssey says, quote, Due to limitations inherent to Bluetooth, our recommendation for the best audio quality on PC is to connect via USB. Bluetooth is inherently lossy, and we consider it a convenience feature rather than a primary connection mode. Additionally, Bluetooth does not support more than two channels of audio. This, of course, is obvious, except that Odyssey refuses to say it on their sales page. Odyssey's use of Bluetooth is not groundbreaking. The mere fact that the Mobius is an Odyssey headphone won't make the Bluetooth signal sound better. Indeed, Bluetooth is sonically the worst of the three connection options present in the Mobius. Planar magnetic and dynamic drivers are only as good as their implementation in the headphones and the source material. The most amazing headphone money can buy will render a streaming file over Bluetooth sound noticeably less dynamic with less fidelity than over hardwired connection. This is exactly the problem with the Mobius. The drivers in this headphone are not amazing, and we'll get to that in due course. But even if they were amazing, the latency-riddled and low-quality Bluetooth connection will render the amazing drivers pointless. That is because the source, the audio file, is downsampled to lower resolution. Those who laugh at me for using Spotify Premium to test headphones should shout even louder at using a planar magnetic headphone over SBC Bluetooth 4.1. This is why I call the Mobius' Bluetooth connection a gimmick it offers absolutely nothing positive. I compared the Mobius to the Sennheiser GSP600, Odyssey EL8, and Odyssey Sign. 
Because the Mobius' performance is best experienced through USB, I decided to use the AudioQuest Dragonfly Red as my USB DAC for the competitor headphones. The Dragonfly Red is a warm DAC, it is not neutral. However, this was not a limitation during the test, and you'll see why very shortly. It turns out that the Mobius is, at best, average in everything. Now, you may be surprised to hear that the Mobius is average. I mean, the marketing promises amazing sound quality, and Odyssey certainly would not lie. Saying a pair of headphones sounds amazing is meaningless unless you compare those headphones to something else. There are two types of claims that Odyssey presents for the Mobius. First, Odyssey says that you will experience a level of depth and realism in your game audio that no other gaming headset can even hope to match. They then double down and also claim that the planar magnetic drivers in these headphones are audiophile grade and provide cinematic sound. The second claim comes from professional reviewers and, most prominently, IGN. IGN is the last place I would look for detailed, honest reviews. Their review of audiophile gear is laughable since they conduct lackluster tests and comparisons if they dare to compare at all. Nevertheless, Odyssey quotes IGN as saying that the Mobius is the best high-end gaming headset you can buy. I compared IGN's comments about the Mobius to the ones IGN made regarding the Sennheiser GSP-600. In the GSP-600 review, IGN said that the sound quality of the Sennheiser headphones was amazing, crystal clear. Their only gripe about the GSP-600 was that it is uncomfortable, a laughable critique in light of the Mobius's painful design. I am not particularly concerned about IGN's position, since it is uninformed and lazy. Instead, I want to concentrate on what Odyssey claims. This is far more important and worthy of scrutiny. Let's address each frequency group one by one. The Mobius is not a bass-heavy headphone. That can be a good thing. Boomy headphones can distort and cause muddiness. But the Mobius is a muddy-sounding headphone regardless. Let's start from the beginning. Again, all my comments about the Mobius is in regards to the USB connection, the connection Odyssey recommends. For this section of the review, I had the 3D effect off, but rest assured, we will talk about the 3D effect later. In Mountains by Hans Zimmer, the Mobius is incapable of reproducing the sub-bass rumble at the beginning of the song. I listened intently for 49 seconds, and only on the 50th second did I hear the rumble, which should have been present from the start of the song. Whatever rumble the Mobius did produce was incredibly low volume. It was barely noticeable. It had very fast transients, good for a planar magnetic driver, but so light that it might as well not have been there. Most disappointingly, the Mobius rendered the crescendo of mountains very poorly. Around two minutes into the song, all the instruments reach their peak volume. The organ plays all of a sudden and the rumble comes out, the treble instruments become sharp or they would in almost any other headphone, but not the Mobius. That rumble from the organ is so light that the character of the song is completely missing. What bass is present is pretty muddy, the sub-bass interacting with the mid-bass which then interacts with the mids. There is no clear separation amongst the instruments. The treble instruments sound very rolled off, as if they are blunted. This is not the cinematic experience I had at the theater when I watched the movie and it is completely different from the rendition I got from the GSP-600, the Odyssey Sign, and the EL-8. These competitor headphones, particularly the GSP-600, had noticeably better sub-bass and mid-bass separation. The muddiness present in the Mobius was not present in the GSP-600. The same is true for the Sign and EL-8. In Pure Water, the Mobius again lacked any rumble, any sub-bass presence. It was fast transients and low volume. Instead of the bass thump, I heard a bass thunk, like the instrument was covered with a thick comforter and its sound muffled. The GSP-600 has a light bass response as well, but it is not muddy. It is clear and the instruments are easily more separated than when I heard the song on the Mobius. The EL-8 has a very similar bass presentation to the Mobius, except maybe a little bit more bass presence, but by perhaps one or two decibels. The sign also had a similar response to the Mobius, but again, the sign had better separation of instruments. The takeaway is that none of the headphones have bass emphasis, but the Mobius is the only one with muddy presentation, overwhelmingly muddy presentation. It has the worst sub-bass and mid-bass separation, and the least amount of bass detail. 
I can say that the mids sound averagely clear some of the time on the Mobius. In the song Want You Back by Haim, the primary vocalist sounds clear at the beginning of the song, when the piano and guitar are playing. However, the backup vocalists that jump into the song around the 23rd second sound less clear. Those backup vocalists are not easily separated in their individual tonalities. In better headphones, the backup vocalists clearly have their own separate tonalities. One can be heard taking a breath just as the other ends her lyrics. In other words, the backup vocalists are not exactly in tune, which is part of the fun listening to this song. But on the Mobius, that is difficult to hear. At lower volumes, you will struggle to find the separation. At higher volumes, you'll hear the separation, but barely. The Mobius instead renders these vocalists more muddy than clear. And when the song starts hitting its crescendo, when all the instruments are playing at maximum volume, the separation of vocalists disappears altogether. They all sound melded. The vocalists sound at most one step ahead of the mix. In the song Superposition, the Mobius does present a fairly smooth rendition of the primary vocalist, a male. He sounds about one step ahead of the mix, but the bass guitar is so muted that it can be hard to hear it even at higher volumes. Once again, the Mobius is not capable of separating multiple vocalists when multiple instruments are playing. Frankly, even when the multiple vocalists are essentially alone in the mix, the Mobius somehow screws that up too, making the separation of their vocals hard to distinguish. Around 2 minutes and 36 seconds of the song Superposition, all the instruments stop. The vocalists are singing a cappella, and yet their tonalities are hard to distinguish. There is the briefest of differences between the vocalists, but that requires very close listening. The GSP-600 has a noticeably better rendition of mids compared to the Mobius. The 600 separates the vocalists more clearly and obviously. During the crescendo in Want You Back, the 600 was able to present the multiple vocalists with their individual tonalities clearer than the Mobius. In an A-B test, I could hear that the 600 was able to separate the voices noticeably better. The EL8 and Sign also seemed to have a slight edge over the Mobius, though it was not as clearly differentiated as it was with the GSP-600. However, it was no worse than the Mobius, but frankly, the lack of muddiness in the EL8 and Sign gave them the edge over the Mobius. This lack of muddiness allowed the multiple vocalists to stand out even when all the instruments in the mix were playing at maximum. The treble sounds a bit muffled on the Mobius as well. There is some energy in treble instruments, but they are not clear or well separated. In Scurzo for X-Wings, the horns sound muffled, losing much of their sharp, precise tones. The brass has some of its treble peak, but also sounds quite blunted, muffled, as if the musician is playing under some thick blanket. The separation between brass, percussion, horns is so minute that it might as well not be there. Frankly, there is no sense that the music is being heard in any grand hall. Rather, it feels very claustrophobic, closed in, like listening to small bookshelf speakers in your bedroom. In the song Flight from the City, the Mobius does something I have not heard in a long time. It represents the piano very similarly to the Neumann NDH20. If you watched my review of that headphone, you know I was critical of its unnatural and tinny presentation in Flight from the City. The Mobius does something quite close. The piano sounds distorted. It sounds like it is being played inside a shipping container, which is the same critique I had for the NDH20. The resonance of the piano frequency is unnatural, almost like you put your head within inches of the piano, something you should definitely not do in real life. The piano has little separation from the cello. Indeed, both sound a little muffled when they are playing together. This is the type of sound signature you might get with cheap speakers in a small room. Throughout the song, you should hear a creaking of wood as the pianist shifts on his bench. That sound comes through intermittently on the Mobius and never clearly. That detail is muffled, and it is missing altogether in areas where it should be present. With the song New Light, the Mobius shows it has no ability to demonstrate depth or verticality, something normal headphones can do. At the beginning of the song, you should hear children playing in the background. Good headphones present this detail not directly into your ears, but somewhere behind. The children should sound distant and behind you. But the Mobius fails. It presented the children directly to my side, that detail being pushed into my ears. The Mobius did not present the voices of the children as if they were behind me. 
Moreover, the children sounded muted and not distant. This might be difficult to understand, but after countless tests with this song using various headphones, I assure you there is indeed a meaningful difference. New Light is also my standard for testing micro details. I listen for the footsteps in the song from 0 to 60 seconds. The gold medal winner is the Focal Clear, which represented 16 footsteps from 0 to 45 seconds. I give every other headphone an additional 15 seconds as a handicap. And how did the Mobius fare? How many footsteps did I hear? 7. I heard 7 clear footsteps in 1 minute. The problem is that there are at least double that many present in the song within that time frame. The Mobius' detail retrieval is no different from the LCD-1, which I stated is an average sounding headphone. Indeed, the Sundara represented more detail than the LCD-1 and consequently also more than the Mobius. I compared all of these treble test songs on the GSB-600. In Scurzo for X-Wings, the GSB-600 had obviously more treble energy, but not the harsh kind. The horns were precise without peakiness. The brass was well separated from the mix and retained its treble energy. In comparison to the Mobius, the 600 was clearer. The Mobius sounds muffled in comparison. In Fly From The City, the GSB-600 rendered the piano totally differently than the Mobius. Where the Mobius made it sound as if my head was inches away from the piano, the 600 presented the sound as if I was standing 15 feet away in a medium-sized room. The piano did not sound muffled or distorted. I heard the creaking of the pianist's bench more clearly than I did on the Mobius. The cello was still a little melded with the piano, but not nearly as much as it was on the Mobius. When I tested the GSB-600 with New Light, there was an immediate difference. The sounds of the children were present behind me, not directly into my eardrum. They sounded distant instead of muted. The 600 provided a sub-bass rumble that was missing in the Mobius. There was an overall clarity that the Mobius was simply incapable of providing. As for the detail of the footsteps, well, I heard 8 in one minute. This is not much different from the Mobius' 7. The sign had a very similar presentation of treble to the Mobius. The horn sounded muffled, but the brass had a bit more energy than they did on the Mobius. The sign was not nearly as muffled as the Mobius. There was slightly better separation of the brass, percussion, and horns with the sign. The sign was a totally different beast with Flight from the City. It had a night and day difference when rendering the piano. Whereas the Mobius made it sound muffled and tinny and distorted, the sign made the piano sound natural and airy. The piano with the sign sounded like it was more than 15 feet away from me in a large room. The decay of the piano strikes was far less muffled than on the Mobius. The cello was clearly separated from the piano frequency, though a bit of melding still existed. The creaking of the pianist's bench was more obvious as well. Whereas the Mobius failed to produce a lot of that creaking and muffled the ones that it did, the sign presented more of that detail and it did it clearly. In New Light, the sign presented the sounds of the kids very similarly to the Mobius, muted and directly into my ear canal, without any sensation that the sound was coming from behind me. However, the rest of the mix was far less muffled than it was on the Mobius. As for the detail of the footsteps, I heard 9. There were a few occasions where I knew there were footsteps and I almost heard them, but I didn't count those. The rule with this test is that I count only the ones that I actually hear. The EL-8 performed similarly to the sign. The treble energy in the horns in Scurzo for Exings was a bit blunted, but the brass was clear. The separation of instruments was the same as with the sign and consequently better than with the separation on the Mobius. In Flight from the City, the EL-8 again sounded fascinatingly similar to the sign. I listened back and forth and had a hard time finding differences between the EL-8 and sign. Both headphones presented the piano far more naturally than the Mobius, where the piano sounded like it was 15 feet away from me in a large room. The cello was also separated well from the piano, though still with a slight melding with the piano frequency. Nevertheless, the song was not muffled like it was with the Mobius. In New Light, the EL-8 made the sounds of the kids much more muted than on any other headphone, including the Mobius. They did not sound distant either. That sound was simply directed into my ears at an extremely low volume. Otherwise, the EL-8 had an almost identical sonic response as the sign. As for the details on the footsteps, I heard at most 7 with the EL-8. Frankly, the presentation of the detail in this song was identical to the Mobius. It was evident that the GSB-600 and Stein provided clearer rendition on the footsteps than either the EL-8 or Mobius. 
the Mobius has very little soundstage. It is abysmal to be frank. There is a total lack of depth, verticality, or width. This headphone is incapable of providing even average soundstage. Compared to the other close-back headphones we tested, the Mobius consistently had less of everything. The largest soundstage was presented through the GSB-600. It was also the clearest of all four headphones. The Sign came second, then the EL-8, and finally, the Mobius. This less-than-average soundstage is why the Mobius sounds so bland, muffled, and undetailed. Sometimes people want a warm or intimate-sounding headphone. But the Mobius does not fit that category. It is not the same signature as with the Meze 99 Classics or Philips Fidelio X2 or AudioQuest Nighthawk, all of which have slightly elevated bass response, clearer mids, and more energetic treble. Instead, the Mobius is an amalgam of incredibly bad design. Maybe with wider soundstage, the Mobius could present better overall, but we are not living in fantasy land. For an audiophile headphone that supposedly caters to gamers, the Mobius has shockingly little soundstage. I am not a gamer per se. I play video games every once in a while. I concede that I do not spend hours every day sitting in front of my PC to play co-op Battlefield. I cannot speak for competitive gamers. I cannot say precisely what a gamer will want in a gaming headphone. If I played games regularly and used headsets, I would have more knowledge about what a gamer will accept. But here's the thing, just because I am not a gamer does not mean I cannot criticize the Mobius for being a failed product. And unlike most of the reviews for the Mobius, I actually provide information that is relevant to discuss Odyssey's claims. Consequently, you may want to disregard everything I say because I don't game. So be it. But I can say with complete confidence that you will spend $400 on a device that has subpar performance. The shtick for the Mobius is not Bluetooth or planar drivers, no. Odyssey barely even talks about these. Odyssey spent the vast majority of its marketing on the 3D effect technology. In fact, that's what reviewers often talk about as well. This 3D technology is not from Odyssey. They didn't create it. Indeed, Odyssey licensed it. A company called Waves produces software that screws with the sound signature. That is the blunt truth. Waves takes the audio and then adds fake surround sound into stereo headphones. Audiophiles have strongly discouraged this, and for good reason. Fake surround sound is shockingly bad. It is no substitute to actual surround sound. But we're talking about gamers and not audiophiles, aren't we? Gamers don't care about good sound. Gamers don't know the difference between fake and real surround sound. Gamers like flashy lights and bright colors and are total idiots. That's apparently what Odyssey thinks. I know that is precisely how companies like Razer see gamers, as uninformed, mindless drones who will buy the next flashy thing because IGN said so. When you are fully immersed in a game, it can be mesmerizing. The ambient sounds, perfectly matched music, the pace of the game, all of that combines for a unique experience. But when audio gear companies shoehorn fake nonsense, they are purposefully screwing with the sound. I listen to the Mobius via USB, 3.5mm, and Bluetooth for the 3D sound effect. For the 3.5mm test, I connected the Mobius to the Dragonfly Red. I also tested it plugged directly into the 3.5mm jack on my computer. The 3D effect works with all connection types. Consequently, you can rest assured you will receive subpar audio at all times. I split my 3D listening test into two categories, music and game elements. Game elements involved footsteps, running, and gunshots. These were heard using online catalogs of game sounds. You can easily find them using a Google search. Let's start with the music category. It sounds ridiculous with the 3D fakery. The Mobius' narrow soundstage, substantially less than average as if you pulled out your old desktop speakers and plonked them on your dresser in the bedroom, is frustratingly worse with the 3D effect. Once you have set the center marker on the headphones, you can move your head and hear sound as if you were turning around physically. This is a disorienting experience. While sitting straight looking at the screen, the 3D effect does not kick in until you move about 15 degrees from center. Thus, slight movement of your head left or right does nothing. You have to turn your head much further for the effect to start. This means that if you are looking at a 15-inch laptop screen, you would have to turn your head so much that you would need to move your eyeballs to the corner of your eyes to see the screen again. That is kinda dumb. There is a slight bit of verticality with the 3D effect. 
If you look up or down, the sound does change up or down depending on perspective, but it is a terribly minor change, significantly less than the left and right motion. Once again, slight movements of the head up or down do not activate the fake verticality. You must actually look up or down to move the sound in that direction. Consequently, I would say that the 3D effect is useless for verticality. Let's talk about the 3D effect with music. When you're listening to songs and turning your head, you get the strong impression that the song is not being played from speakers, but through a tube. Audiophiles continually demand their headphones present music naturally. Well, that's a little vague. I think what we mean by naturally is that the music should sound as if it would at a live performance. The Mobius does not do that. Instead, the Mobius has the awful habit of presenting music on a narrow soundstage when you are sitting dead center, and then limits that soundstage even further when you turn your head. If you sit and listen to music and turn your head, the volume will decrease significantly in one ear cup and remain the same in the other. Let's assume you sit facing your computer screen. You turn your head beyond 15 degrees to the left. Let's say you turn your head directly 90 degrees from dead center. When you do that, the volume in the left speaker will decrease dramatically, but the volume in the right speaker will remain the same. This is not how music is supposed to sound. You can conduct a very simple experiment at home that will demonstrate how the Mobius works. If you have a pair of headphones, plug them into your amplifier. Get an empty roll from a paper towel and tape it down. Put the headphones on one end. Then sit down and listen from the other end of the tube. Turn your head left and right. You'll get the idea. That is how the Mobius sounds. It is ridiculous, unnatural, frustrating, and disorienting. When I initially listened to the Mobius the first time, I felt disorientation from this idiotic 3D effect. Over the two weeks test for this review, I have managed to deal with the effect, but I feel palpable relief as soon as I sit dead center again or take the headphones off. The fake 3D effect is utterly pointless for music. It is just as useless and stupid for gaming. Let us assume you are sitting at your desk playing a game. If you turn in your seat, you'll get an immediate change in volume in one ear cup. Why is this supposed to be fun? You might say that gamers need this effect, but why? Gamers need detail retrieval and object placement. That is, they need to know where and how far away footsteps are. That clearly is something the Mobius fails at miserably. As a gamer, you are going to sit straight looking at your monitor or TV. That is how games are played. If you play virtual reality games, few and far between, perhaps the Mobius offers something of value. That is because you are sometimes able to turn around in physical space to make your game character mimic your actions. But all virtual reality games I have seen require controllers with joysticks to move your character, which translates to you standing still in one spot but moving your head to look around. If you play your standard video game and hear a gunshot in the right ear cup, are you going to turn your head to the right? No! You're going to turn your game character by moving the mouse or hitting the keys or pushing the joysticks. Why would you turn your head in the real world? I do not watch competitive esports, but I have seen enough of it to make this observation. Competitive players are glued to their screens. They do not turn their heads. They focus on the game directly ahead. Small children without developed auditory cortexes will turn their heads wildly when they hear a sound but they grow out of it eventually. Odyssey developed a headphone that assumes you still swing your head around when you hear noises in your headphones. But what about the use of 3D effect in music playback? Odyssey and its collaborators uploaded videos of professional artists using the Mobius in studio. You can see the fakery at work. A mixing and mastering artist apparently is easily impressed with the Mobius. When moving his head, he thinks he can hear portions of the orchestra. The Odyssey marketing in this regard is so disingenuous that I'm surprised they decided to use it. When listening to music, you will do one of several things. You might sit still, read a book, or work on your computer. Or you might walk around, or you might dance, or you might work out. On the Mobius with the 3D effect on, anyone who walks, runs, turns, slips, slides, sneezes, wheezes, faints, staggers, violently burps, or simply changes posture 15 degrees off-center will experience disorientation and continual change in volume in one ear cup or another. 
I don't know about the Odyssey engineers, but I prefer to listen to music with both my ears at the same time. Look, I'm not trying to sound stuck up. If this technology actually did something fun and unique, I would be interested. But it doesn't do anything worthwhile. It is useless for gamers and audiophiles alike. Even the Odyssey promotional video demonstrated that you must physically turn in order to trigger the 3D effect. And after the first few attempts, the novelty wears out. The 3D effect narrows the already narrow soundstage. It causes loss of detail and resolution on top of the mediocre performance of the Mobius. As I said previously, the company that makes this 3D effect software is called Waves. Waves claims that their 3D technology is perfect for music. They say, quote, when you listen to your favorite songs over headphones, you experience them in an incredibly narrow way. With sounds competing over limited sonic space, not anymore, Waves NX makes music sound the way it was intended to be heard, letting you finally hear every little sonic detail in three-dimensional clarity. Bull shit. Total, unmitigated, unrepentant, unfiltered bullshit. The Waves technology does not provide every little sonic detail in clarity. It does not make music sound as it was intended. This is such a bogus claim that Waves should be sued for making it. No mixing and mastering artist creates songs to be heard on Waves technology. They do not present music on CD so that it could be listened to in 3D effect. All music is made with stereo sound in mind, not 5.1 or 7.1 or fake surround sound. Stereo. Oh, but Waves doesn't stop at audio listening. No, they take it up a notch and claim that professionals need the technology to mix and master. They say, quote, Waves NX recreates the three-dimensional experience of listening to professional speakers on headphones. NX immerses the producer or engineer in a virtual mixing room, delivering the accurate sound localization and externalization necessary for mixing, mastering, and recording. Waves has the ego to say that artists need their software gimmickry to better record music. I think artists have been doing a fantastic job so far without it. Messing with algorithms and software is not how audiophiles want to listen to music. Those who spend thousands of dollars on cables, amplifiers, DACs, turntables, and DSD files would balk at the fake 3D nonsense. And those of us who do not buy into the AudioQuest cable bullshit, DSD audio, and top-of-the-line equipment also would not jump to buy a Waves product. Why? because the 3D bullshit never adds anything helpful. Software does not add details that are not already recorded. Software does not create sound space that was not in the recording. Software only fools around with the recording to pretend details are clearer. Not once during my test with the Mobius did I hear instruments behind me as I sat still listening. Not once did I hear enhanced details. Not once did I hear even average soundstage, let alone large soundstage. Odyssey is trying to make a big deal about the Mobius, and it has partnered with Waves to get the word out. They want you to believe that the Mobius is the headphone you need to buy to hear 3D sound. But that's simply a lie. You see, Waves works with any headphone. You can use any headphone with the Waves software. Because Waves is software, you can download it on your computer. You can use the fake 3D effect with a cheap pair of monoprice headphones or the full Cal Utopia. It doesn't matter. For a little over $100, you can buy the software and use it with your favorite headphones. Headphones that likely have better detail retrieval, more soundstage, and overall better clarity than the Mobius. So why buy the Mobius? I very much dislike the Bear Dynamic DT1770, and I was critical of the Neumann NDH20. I have never loathed a headphone as much as I loathe the Mobius. It is a deplorable headphone. It is uncomfortable. It feels heavy because of poor padding. It has less than average soundstage. It has light bass that is barely audible. It has muddy mids. It has an uneven treble response. It uses the bottom barrel Bluetooth codex, meaning you get less than ideal resolution for your $400 headphones. It sounds like listening to music or games through the tube of an empty paper towel roll. The Sennheiser GSB-600 sounds better in every category it can be found for less than 200 bucks. The Odyssey sign sounds noticeably better than the Mobius. In like new condition, the sign can be found for under 
The EL8 has a similar sound signature to the Scion, and it too can be found for under $300. But you should forget planar magnetic drivers. You see, the Mobius sounds so damn bad that any decent dynamic driver headphone would be an upgrade. The Philips X2 has wider soundstage and slightly more clarity. The NAD HP50 has significantly more clarity and soundstage. The Sennheiser HD380 Pro is more comfortable, more clear, and hands down, more neutral. Yes, the Mobius very likely sounds better than many headphones. Many cheap headphones from the early 2000s. But at $400, the Mobius has no excuse to be so subpar. I know there will be plenty of people who disagree with me. Some of those people will actually have the Mobius. A lot of them will not. But if you are going to present a counterpoint, then make it factual. Tell me how the 3D effect helps you in your gaming, and why it is important for you. Tell me how the 3D effect has changed the way you listen to music, and why it's important. Tell me which headphones the Mobius replaces, and why the replaced headphones were not satisfactory. The reason I'm asking for this information is because I truly want to know, and I truly want you to analyze the headphone. I rarely give a do not buy recommendation. The last headphone I recall telling people not to buy is the DT1770. But I'm saying now not to buy the Mobius. Look, I don't want to rehash the stuff I have already mentioned at length. But the Mobius is $300 too expensive. The only special thing about the Mobius is how especially bad it is at audio. It is a shame that Odyssey took this route. But I have noticed recently this is how Odyssey now plans to work. They want to use hype and fakery rather than actual skill. Odyssey is capable of so much better. They have great engineers and excellent customer service. Thus, I cannot fathom why they put out the Mobius. It doesn't sound like a planar magnetic. It doesn't feel like a planar magnetic. It isn't Odyssey. It's a fake. There are cheaper alternatives that sound significantly better. What has Odyssey become? Let's take a quick look at their product line. The LCD series has not changed in many years, and I'm fine with that. They've got a sound signature for all the big LCD headphones, and they should stick with it. But then there's the LCD One. It is an average headphone at an above average price. My full conclusion about this is coming soon. Also take a look at the LCD Two GX, an LCD Two with a microphone attached to it. Big whoop de doo And now, here's the Mobius. What is going on? Is Odyssey simply unable to come up with meaningful products? Are they content with shipping disappointing headphones so that they can encourage us to download their reveal software to make the poorly performing headphones sound a little better? Is this what it has come to? What a sad state of things. Odyssey, you have lost your way. And frankly, so has the Mobius.